that look familiar? Hopefully. Okay, so um, we um, are kind of breaking ourselves into uh, some of the basic biology, right? So one of the things that so we talked a little bit about taxonomy, we talked a little bit about the big biological questions of life. Those are important, right? Because those are major themes that we touch on as we go throughout um, uh, biology. And uh, that's and the reason why those are important is because whenever, and you will get there, right? So whenever you're in a chapter studying something um, and you're kind of like, like deep in the woods and you're just like, okay, wait a minute, why, why, why again are we doing this exactly, right? Why are we studying metabolism, that sort of thing? And generally speaking, those big biological questions of life helps to help you to frame the motivation and the purpose and what you're going toward. Okay, so when you kind of get sort of lost in the weeds a little bit and you kind of feel like you're kind of getting lost, sometimes it's, it's helpful to sort of step back a little bit, sort of readjust yourself so at least you can reorient your perspective and kind of refresh your memory that there's a reason for all of this. We're going somewhere with this. It's not just for kicks and grins. So the next big topic then is obviously not just the way that we organize life, right, which is what taxonomy was about, but now how... Um, um, how the actual living systems themselves are organized in a hierarchy, right? And so there's different levels of everything associated with this. So you can kind of think of it like a layer, like a layer cake, basically. There's lots of layers um, to living organisms. And if we st we're going to start off first of all with the smallest level, um, and that is the atomic level. So the, the atom level is the smallest level that we have. Basically everything in the universe is made up of atoms except for energy. Um, and so if you are defined as mass, right, if you have if you if you have matter to you, you take up space and you are here physically, then you are made of atoms and everything is made of atoms. Um, it, living and non-living, right? So this is kind of like the fundamental building blocks, the fundamental stuff that the universe is built of. Um, then when you start to move to the next level of organization, the next level in the hierarchy, uh, what oftentimes happens <clears throat> is one level builds on the other, right? And so now that we have atoms, if we put two atoms together in a shared relationship, then we're gonna create molecules. And now all of a sudden we're starting to get interested. Right. Instead of just having like a big pile of atoms all over the place, now all of a sudden we're able to start creating some things that actually have some function. Here's a good example. This one here, that's a nice little handy little molecule. Which one's that? Yeah, right. So that's a, that's a useful one. Of course, we're not just interested in water. That's a fairly simple molecule. We're also interested in big molecules, right? So molecules can come in lots of varieties. It can be very simple like water or carbon dioxide. Or they can be quite large and complicated, like macromolecules, like DNA, for instance, or proteins, or things of that nature. So we have an entire chapter that covers those macromolecules, um, and we'll get to those guys. But that's basically, they're all the same. They're an assembly of atoms that are linked together with shared relationships of various types. Now, in chapter two, we plumb the depths of what those relationships are and how those atoms actually come together. Okay, that's the stuff of chemistry. Then once you kind of get to this macromolecule level, DNA, carbohydrates, things like that, you can put these molecules together in an organized form to create organelles. So what is an organelle? An organelle is basically a membrane bound structure <coughs> that typically has a definable function. Not all organelles do the same thing. Right, so like for instance, what is that function that we're looking for? Well, let's take a look at our big biological questions of life list, right? There's a series of functions there. Some of those functions are energetic in nature. As a result, some organelles are tasked with dealing with that energetic component. And that's all they do. They're like specialists in that energy thing. So they don't do like the heredity thing. They don't do like the reproduction thing. Their job is energy and that's what they do. Um, and so these organelles kind of basically represent compartments of function that are bound by uh, membranes. Then if you put an assembly of organelles together, 
in a way that covers all of your big biological questions of life to the point where you're capable of reproducing, then you've got a cell. Okay? And a cell is oftentimes defined as the basic unit of life. And that's a common thing you're going to see in multiple textbooks, multiple sources. This is a pretty standard way we look at the cell. Now, what do we mean by that, right? So a lot of times we'll say this and then instructors will move on and they just assume you know what that means, but that's not necessarily so, right? So what do we mean when we say it's the basic unit of life? Well, what we mean when we say it's the basic unit of life, let's kind of break this one down and define what that term means. What this means is this is the smallest that we can get and still answer all of the big biological questions of life. All of them, all right? This is the first level where you're able to do that. Now, organelles, can they answer some of those big questions? Well, yeah, but they don't answer all of them. Right, like the energy organelle only answers the energy question. It doesn't answer the rest of them. So you're not a whole, right? This oftentimes is defined as sort of the, the lowest level that you can get to and still be defined as a living thing, okay? So the single celled organism is as small as you can get. As soon as you blow that cell up, you don't have definable life anymore. Why? Not because you don't hash with our philosophical view of life. That doesn't matter but because you fundamentally can't answer all of those big biological questions of life. And that's the definition of a living thing. Okay. So here's kind of what it looks like for you visual types, right? So um, over here, we have atoms of various sorts, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen. These guys will come together to form molecules, some simple, some complex. This is an example of uh, what looks like a, um, a fatty acid type of a thing. Um, so this is a type of macromolecule that falls into one of the four overall types of macromolecules. And you put these guys together. And so here's a larger macromolecule, right? So this is like a small version of this. And so this is your DNA molecule, obviously, right? So one of the probably most important of all the macromolecules that we have. Um, and then you put all these macromolecules together to create an organelle. In this case, it's mitochondria. This is one of those energetic um, organelles whose job it is to do the energy thing. And then you put all these organelles together to form a cell. So this particular cell right here looks like it's a neuron, but it's got a bunch of organelles in it that basically allows it to be able to answer all of those big biological questions of life if that's necessary. By the way, where most of Bio 111 exists, or Bio 1111, I guess it is now, Right. This is where this is. Now, if you spend a lot of time up here in atoms and molecules, usually you're in some version of a chem class. That's where you are. If you're in a mac, if you're focused like a laser beam on the macromolecule, DNA, proteins, things like that, then you're probably in more of like a biochem class. Okay. Now, what happens if we keep scaling up? Right. So we've assembled some organelles into cells. Now, what do we do if we assemble cells into groups? Well, assembling cells into groups is going to get you to your next level of organization, which is the tissues level. This is basically a bunch of cells that are fastened together with cell connections. We'll talk about those later in the semester. That gives you some sort of a definable function at the tissue level, right? So there, these are cells that decide to work together as a cooperative. Now then, we don't stop there, do we? because we're not, we're not functional yet, are we? We're just basically a blob of tissue. So then, um, what about, this? what happens then if we take a bunch of tissues and put them together? So to associate the tissues together to create something else. Well, that something else is an organ. So this is basically an assembly of tissues, generally speaking, with a common function. So all the tissues are working together as a uh, you know, team organ, whatever this organ's job is to do, all these tissues are working together to do the job of this particular organ. Now, if you assemble a bunch of organs together, then you get the organ system. 
Okay. Now to break this one down, this is actually fairly straightforward. I, I like to use the digestive system as an example of this one, right? So here's an organ system with multiple organs in it. The digestive system has your stomach, has your small intestines, has your large intestines. Uh, it also has some organs that are not associated with the long tube that has an in-hole and an out-hole, right? It also has accessory organs. For instance, the pancreas is an accessory organ for digestion. And so is the liver, right? I like to use the liver because the liver does a lot. Um, and it has a lot of tissues in it. So the liver is an organ in the digestive system. But within the organ itself, it's also got different tissues associated with it, right? Because in the liver, you've got liver tissue, which are the liver cells, but you also have connective tissue because the lobes of the liver are connected together to each other with webs or sheets of connective tissue. That's a completely different tissue. Okay? There's also lots of blood vessels that permeate the liver. And those blood vessels are another different type of tissue. So here you have multiple different tissue types that are coming together to give you the overall structure of the liver. Okay, so that's a perfect example. If you're in this region here and you're spending a lot of time in this region, you're usually in some sort of an anatomy and physiology class. So that's all for all you aspiring pre-health students. So this is your next stop, right? So for those of you who are taking this to get yourself ready for AMP, this is where you're gonna be living in AMP. As a matter of fact, right after you guys, I have my AMP one class and we are actually getting ready to start talking about exactly this tissues, All right? So understanding the different tissue types and how to, how to identify them and things of that nature. So, but let's keep going, shall we? Because we're not just a bunch of random organ systems, right? If you put a bunch of organ systems together, then what do you get? You, right, the organism. Um, and so this represents another big sort of landmark step of function. So you are functional as an individual when all of your organ systems are assembled together and functioning correctly. Just like the cell is a functional level when all the organelles are assembled and functioning correctly. So here you can see you have uh, the tissue level here. So you can see this is a neuron with all sorts of different types of tissues. So these little black lines are different types of tissues. There's lots of other little cells in there that are different types of cells. So these are all different types of um, tissues that are generally labeled as neural tissue. There's different things going on in neural tissue. There's not just a cell type, right? There's multiple different types of cells in the actual nervous tissue. This will come together to give you your organs. So here's the little bird brain. Um, and then that'll be part of an organ system. So that your bird brain plus all of your peripheral nerves. And then of course, all your other systems, respiratory system, cardiovascular system, immune system all come together to form our favorite campus residents, which are our Canadian geeks, which always leave their little calling cards wherever we go. And it gets a little tricky walking around campus sometimes without picking up souvenirs. But anyway. It's very distracting. I'm all like, um, it's like, especially in spring, it's like you're playing hopscotch. It's like, you know, you're kind of dancing around and people are looking at you like, um, <laughs> it's like, and of course you run into that, the geese diarrhea, right? Those are my favorites. It's like, wow, you need help right there. So uh, whoever did that one, you guys need some treatments. Um, just saying, <laughs> but anyway, let's keep going, right? What happens if we put an assembly of organisms together? Hello, all of you in the room, you're an assembly of organ organisms. Well, what we get here then is a population. This is an assembly of organisms of the same species. So we're talking about us. There's a, a population of homo sapiens in this room. However, we can keep going the next level up, right? What if we get now an assembly of populations? That's a community. So this is where you have multiple populations. Okay, what would that look like in this room? Well, let's take a look at it. This is a microbiology room. So we're not alone, right? So there is a population of homo sapiens in here. Here we are, right? Um, there's also a population of um, cockroaches. I'm not saying the cockroaches right here, but there are in the lab, right? They're in the little enclosure. Everybody's looking like, where? 
right? I start stopping on stuff. Um, so that's another population, right? There's a population of bacteria. Actually, there's probably quite a few populations of bacteria, different types of bacteria. That's just life in a micro lab, right? They're messy. They're the messiest labs on campus sometimes, biologically speaking. But there's all these different populations in here, not just us. So we form together, all these populations together, we form the community of 1107, okay? Now, what happens if you start taking these communities? Let's say we take 1107, we add it to 1103, which we're going to here just shortly. We know that there's stuff in there, right? We know there's a population of Madagascar hissing cockroaches in there. We know there's a millipede in there. We know there's a couple of turtles, right? Maurice and Rosalind. So we know they're there. We know there's fish there. So we know there's another community, a community of 1103. Now, what happens if we put these communities together and we let these guys interact. Like for instance, some of you guys, uh, I don't know if it was just you guys, where Gigi walked in, she was giving the turtle a little bit of a, of a little bit of a, a walk. Did you walk turtles? It must've been another section, but as she's one of the work studies, so she kind of loves to take care of the turtles. Um, that's her favorite job. But when you have multiple communities that interact, with each other and their non-living environment. That's a key piece. That's an ecosystem. The new innovation of the ecosystem is that non-living environment component. So for instance, when we're here in the room and you guys are stepping on the cockroaches, um, that's us, different populations interacting with each other, right? Um, and so if we are interacting with what's down the hall in 1103, that, those are two different communities that are interacting with each other, right? And how do they interact with each other? How do different populations interact with each other? Through all the animal behavior that you guys all read about, right? So when, when, carnivores are chasing down their prey and eating them, that is an interaction. When herbivores are migrating so that they can find fresh food sources, that is an interaction. Uh, when they're running away from the lion, that's an interaction, right? So all of these behaviors that animals have are all interactions between each other, but they're also interacting between themselves and the environment as well, right? So how does that work? Well, let's take a look at it. Um, what are some non-living components of the environment that we interact with? It's all over the ground right now. Yeah, snow, precipitation, right? Rain in some cases, snow in others, but what's happening? We're interacting with each other, right? And with our non-living environment. Whenever you slow down in snow, because you don't want to be in a ditch somewhere. You are interacting with your fellow population members because you don't want to hit the other car and your non-living environment because you are slowing down, right? So anything like that, anything that's non-living that organisms respond to, especially plants are a big one for this, right? Because they respond immediately to rainfall, to soil nutrients, um, to moisture in the soil, uh, to different types of metabolites in the soil. So they're constantly in interaction with their environment and we're in interaction with them. And so in an ecosystem, this non-living component is a big gamish. And if you put a bunch of ecosystems together, then you get what's called the biosphere. So this is better known as the earth. For those of you past fourth grade. So an ecosystem and most of these levels are fascinating, right? Because every time you sort of graduate from one level to another, they pick up a new set of abilities. It's like leveling up in a video game, right? Um, only in this case, what we call these is what's called emergent properties. T technically speaking, what we mean by emergent properties is that what you're able to do on one level exceeds what you predict you should be able to do 
before you get there. Does that make sense? It means like what you're able to do exceeds the sum of what you should be able to do. So it's like a synergistic effect. And so you're, it's like you're, instead of leveling up, you like level up and it's like all of a sudden it's like a super turbo version of leveling up, right? Um, and so you didn't expect that but it happened and you're happy about it because now you can do all this extra stuff and you weren't expecting that okay so it's oftentimes not linear um but this is kind of an important thing so you get a lot of new function a lot of synergistic function every time you move up another level um so here's kind of what it looks like for those of you who are keeping track visually so we're going to stick with our little bird friends so you can see here how you have in this particular case a population of geese these are not canadian geese these are looks like brant's geese actually uh, so this is a population in an, in uh, an area so like in a habitat right and so you have different species oftentimes uh, that you're looking at so here you have a golden eye versus a canadian goose and the community, remember, is composed of multiple populations. So you have different populations here. So different types of geese here. So you have some Canadian geese, some Brant's geese, or snow geese, perhaps. Um, and you also have, don't forget, right? You have also organisms, populations in the water itself. So you have a population of fish in there, even if you can't see it. The grasses, that's a population of organisms as well. And there's different types of grasses. There's weeds. There's populations of weeds in those grasses. There's populations of trees in these grasses. And so you have all these different populations, some of which you recognize and identify and notice and some of which you don't, but they're still there. And if you're bringing all those together in interaction with each other and then drop them into a non-living environment where they're interacting with it, then you get an ecosystem. So here's an ecosystem where you can see all these populations interacting with each other. But the reason why they show the mountain is because you're above tree line here. Right, and you have all these non-living environmental factors. For instance, snowfall, um, snowfall, but also a fairly arid um, area. Right, so there's not a lot of moisture there. How do you know that? Because there's nothing growing there. Well, there actually is. You got to get up there and look at it. But there's no trees growing there because you're above tree line, right? And so that's going to be an interaction of trees with their environment, combination of moisture plus elevation. Right, you just simply can't survive at those higher elevations. And so that is you interacting with your non-living environment and you put all these ecosystems together to create the world itself and all those habitat cells. So if you are studying this, these guys here, okay, keep, but go back. Need my heavy pause here. So generally speaking here, you're probably looking at uh, biology two, bio two is probably where you're looking at organismal, especially in population you'll probably talk about, but you'll definitely be looking at ecology, maybe environmental science. So that's what, that's where you are in these, in this area here. Those are the types of classes that you'll be in. Okay. So we already talked a lot about the nature of science and the, philo the, philo the philosophical underpinnings of science. So I don't wanna to spend too much more time here because I think I made my point um, and I don't wanna belabor that. But when you take a look at science, you always keep in mind that when you're looking at science, you're looking at really one thing, like a laser beam, you're looking at natural forces, right? Matter of fact, this is basically the study of natural law. That's what it focuses on, right? So the world that we know and the physical laws that govern it, that's what science is about. Uh, by the way, for those of you who are, who care, <laughs> um, there is a, the, the term natural law is also to be found in the field of theology as well, but it means something completely different, okay? That is not that natural law. So this natural law is simply the rules of the road, the physical universal rules of the road that governs all things science. And so that's basically what we're looking for. Um, and so for the most part in science, there's a couple of things. Um, first of all, the, the laws that we have that govern our reality in this world um, have lar they're largely in place and they're stable and they're consistent, right? So that's an assumption that we make. 
Um, and for the most part, the, the laws that we have have largely been in place since the beginning, right? Especially when you're taking a look at the universal laws, uh, things like gravity and the laws of thermodynamics and the laws that are coming to us from physics, that's certainly true. Now, where this one, I think, gets kind of a little dicey, and this kind of comes to one of those soft spots, those pokeable points, is oftentimes what will happen in biology is we sort of take this concept and we apply it to biology, which I think is not correct, because we know that in biology things change, and they are not static. Um, and a lot of things actually uh, don't change, and they're not static. And so... This is a, a concept that we have that in general um, in geology comes to us as what's referred to as the, um, the concept of uniformitarianism, which is that all of the geological things that we see today have largely been the same in the past and have not changed, um, which is actually flagrantly not true because we can actually measure how variable those things are in real time. Um, now, that's what I mean by you can't apply this to some of those phenomena like that because there are things in this universe that are static and what I call like the framework, right? They are the structural steel of the universe and they basically prop everything up and those are unchanging and that's true, right? But then there are things within that framework that are designed to be dynamic. They're designed to change and they're designed to be malleable. And sometimes scientists will misappropriate this static concept to the dynamic okay, for their own purposes, typically, which is the reason why I say, you know, you have to be careful and be intellectually honest. So and I'll point out those, right? I'll point out those uh, those moments when when we run into them. So objectivity of science, we already know this one, right? So we basically have to be objective. Um, and in science, we also have two major types of, of areas that we use, reasoning that we use. These actually come from logic. So if you've ever studied logic, it's an entire uh, discipline of thinking. It's actually quite fun. Um, and as a matter of fact, when you study logic, and, and if you ever have a chance to study logic, do it. Because it is, it is a lot of fun. And it really does change the way you look at the world because you'll be able to see a bunch of logically fallacious arguments and claims in the world, like everywhere. Like political cycles are hilarious uh, because they are just, I mean, they're dripping with logical fallacy, you know, and it's, and it's, uh, <laughs> And it's, it's hysterical, but the problem is, you know, it's like, and, I, and watching presidential debates are just a hoot for me because I'm all like, okay, that's logically inconsistent. That's a logical fallacy. You can't make that conclusion from your premise, you know? And it's like, it's, it's hysterical, but the problem, it's also depressing, right? Because after you sort of strip everything away that's logically uh, fallacious, then you don't really have much left over. And then you realize, wait a minute, this is the guy who's gonna have his hand on the button. I mean, for four years, this is depressing. <laughs> this, this country needs to go. But anyway, um, so, but it is fun. Um, people generally don't like it, though, when you call them out on it. <laughs> um, but deductive and deductive reasoning are two different types of logical ways of thinking that science makes use of. Now, here's the question. What is deductive reasoning? Well, it's very simple. Most of actually what you see in science, right? The, the whole, the whole, a uh, concept of, you know, I'm going to collect some data and then from my data, I'm going to make some sort of a conclusion, right? That is a deductive process. What that basically means is generally speaking, um, you're going to use general principles, right? Which is oftentimes referred to as a premise. So you're going to lay down some sort of a premise. In this case, in science, it's a data premise, right? So your data is saying something. And then from that, you're going to make specific predictions. And the idea is if your reasoning is correct, then what you predict should occur, right? So you should be able to actually see your predictions come true if your reasoning is correct. Um, 
And so that is deductive reasoning. That's probably the one we know of the most. Could you, I mean, could you argue that like if somebody just is so true, even if it isn't scientifically backed, like if you're you know, getting, you know, messing it up with things wrong, it's like if you don't see like one answer as being correct, like there is a great thing that's not the right one. Oh yeah, yeah. No, there's there's definitely self-delusion in in um in all of these, right? Um, like, I mean, a, fa a famous thing that, you know, a lot of political operators will say, um, and the reason why a lot of them, they don't put a lot of stock in data and polls and stuff like that is because you, you hear this very cynical phrase every now and then, especially during pol big political cycles, like presidential elections. You know, it's like, oh, data doesn't mean anything. You can make data say whatever you want, which is actually true. That's a little cynical, but that's kind of an example of self-delusion, you know, where you're actually not being intellectually honest with yourself. Right, you're being an advocate, but you're worse than an advocate. You're a deceptive advocate. You're basically straight out lying to somebody. You know that what you're doing isn't intellectually honest, but you're trying to dupe people into believing otherwise. Um, so, and you can, and none of that, but that can be intentional, where you know it's a lie. It can also be unintentional, where you basically believe your own lie. So that's kind of a delusional. So there's a delusional version of that and a non-delusional version of that. Either way, it's damaging, right? But that's the reason why in science, like when you do data, because of that idea, you can make data say whatever you want. It's very important. And we put a lot of energy into making sure it's like, okay, that's fine that you got data, but number one, how good is your data, right? I mean, how good is it really? Um, and, and, and do I believe it? Right, so it's, it's a point of skepticism, um, generally speaking. But if it's not logically consistent, and if it doesn't, if your data doesn't produce obvious predictions that are consistent with observation, then that's a point of skepticism. Then your critic's gonna be like, yeah, I don't think you, I don't, I don't think you're right, right? Um, and so that's kind, of, that's kind of what the response is. So remember why I mentioned the T-Rex, stuff that's kind of where that is now right i mean that was so sensational that the scientific response was that's interesting but my first question is how good is your data right the first questions coming out were like are you sure right i mean did you do that right let me see your methods right what did you do i don't think you're competent enough and they're not really saying that right they're not trying to insult insult her um, they're just saying, listen, maybe you made a mistake. Maybe this is something else, right? Maybe you misinterpreted. Let's take a look at your data and look for logical consistency that leads to testable predictions. And that's what they did. And that's kind of what, that's where they are. Okay. Um, so the other one is inductive reasoning. So this one's a little bit different. This is kind of more like a legal version of reasoning. This is essentially where you're making um, lots of observations to draw, derive your conclusions. So this is kind of like in legal speak, this is the preponderance of evidence. Ever heard that term? No? Preponderance of evidence, it's a legal thing. So it's basically the idea that any one piece of evidence is insufficient to convict you because it's circumstantial. But if you've got lots of little bits of circumstantial evidence, then the accumulation of that starts to weigh heavy on you and starts to be kind of sort of starts to sway the opinion, right? So that's kind of what that, that's the one that's like. So you, you basically get convicted on circumstantial evidence. But the thing is like, well, wait a minute, if you didn't do it, then you shouldn't have this big laundry list of a circumstantial evidence Right, circumstantial evidence, if you didn't do it, you might have one or two pieces of circumstantial evidence just by bad luck, but it's not gonna be enough to convict you on. But if you actually did it, then you're gonna have this big pile of circumstantial evidence that's gonna add up to like, uh, looks like you did it, right? Um, so that's what's called the preponderance of evidence. Same thing, inductive reasoning is the same. So this is a good example of inductive reasoning is a situation in biology, like for instance, biology, we were very observational uh, for a long period of time, but here's a good thing, right? So if I were, this is a good example of inductive reasoning. So if I were to ask you, what color is the sky? What would you say?
Go ahead. I can hear you. Blue, right? So if I were to ask you, why don't you go outside tomorrow? Tell me what color is this guy? Nope, nope, the real color of the sky, not the clouds, right? If I tell you to go out the day after that, what color is it? So if I, do you have to go outside to tell me what color it is? Why not? Because you've made a conclusion, haven't you? How long ago in your life did you make that conclusion? Probably so long ago you don't remember, do you? You were little, probably waddling around, right? So how do you know it's blue? Well, the reason why you know it's blue is because over literally millions and millions of observation throughout a lifetime, has the sky ever been any other color? The real sky, not like, you know, forest fire sky, not that, right? The real sky. Has it ever been any other color? No. That's inductive reasoning. Through the preponderance of millions of observations, you can now comfortably conclude that the sky is blue. Not because you did some sort of a fancy test in the lab to prove that it's blue, but because of the accumulation of many observations, you've never actually seen the opposite to be true. So the more of those observations you have and the more times you see the observation, it comes out the same and it's consistent then you get to the place where it's like, you know what, I'm starting to feel comfortable now. We've looked at a lot. We've looked at the sky in a lot of different days and a lot of different places in this world under a lot of different circumstances. And I still have yet after millions and millions of observations to see the sky a different color. So I'm comfortable now making a conclusion to say the sky is blue. That's inductive reasoning. You've taken an overall accumulation of observations that have not changed, have told you the same story over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. And you get to the point where it's like, okay, I think we're safe to conclude now this many observations that the sky is indeed blue. Okay. So that's inductive reasoning. And we have a couple of cases of that. So um, science has a couple of different flavors to it when we take a look at it. Um, in one case, we can think of science as descriptive, right? There's actually two, uh, descriptive goes along with its alternate partner. Its alternate partner typically is uh, interpretive, right? So when you have something where you're trying to sort of interpret something or sort of synthesize something, that's interpretive science. That's a little dicier, right? Because you're kind of creating something and you're kind of getting out there on, on that kind of intellectual thin ice. Um, you're, you're kind of going out of limp, right? When you're doing interpretation, you're subjecting yourself to like, well, this is how I think it is, but I'm not sure. This is kind of how I'm interpreting it, right? A lot of, for instance, of the evolutionary ideas that reach way back into history, oftentimes can be thought of as interpretive in nature, right? And so they kind of have that sort of level of uncertainty to them because we're not quite sure exactly how it all went down because it was just so long ago. Descriptive science is something, uh, well, here's descriptive science. What happened? Yeah, it fell. Can I measure that? Yeah, right? So basically what you did was an experiment to say, what happens when I let go of the pen? It fell. Great, that's descriptive science. Basically descriptive science focuses on like how does it happen, right? What happened and how does it happen? It's very mechanistic in nature. It's very real time. So you're describing a process. I drop the pen and you're describing it. Now we can go in there scientifically and measure it. Well, how fast did it accelerate to the earth, right? That's kind of getting into physics labs and things like that, right? So how fast was it accelerating? Would it be different if it were a heavier object, right? And so you can kind of get into all of these different sorts of descriptive features of explaining the phenomenon of the fact that when I drop something, it always proceeds to the earth, right? And of course, then we start to figure out gravity is a thing. That's kind of how 
Newtonian physics got started. That's descriptive science. Typically speaking, when we're talking about descriptive science, we're trying to explain the world around us. And it's natural laws. So oftentimes we do what we just did with the pen, right? We make some sort of an observation. Question is, why did the pen fall? So we make some sort of a hypothesis then. Okay, get that. And then from this hypothesis, typically we test it with an experiment. So we're trying to define some sort of a system, some sort of a mechanism. We want to understand how the world around us works. And there's a lot of work to be done there, okay? Because it's not a very simple world. It's a very complex world. And so a lot of that is descriptive. So classification, right? So taxonomy is descriptive. Um, the human genome um, is descriptive, but the information from it is also interpretive. Um, and so that's kind of where I would argue with Mason is that it is also interpretive because you're using the description of the human genome to make inferences uh, between about our relationships with each other, right? So, which is one of the reasons why I said that evolution is actually a genomic thing because you can't change a species without changing your genes, and that is your genome. So, if you're trying to understand the relationships of how things change organismally, you're really asking the question of how your genes change, okay? So, the two are one to one, okay? <clears throat> So we've already talked a little bit about that. That's kind of uh, the blab slide for what we just talked about. Okay, now let's take a look at the scientific method. This is actually something um, that sets science apart from the other intellectual disciplines, things like um, philosophy and theology, right? So those are two uh, very big uh, intellectual disciplines. They have their place, they have their goals, they have their purpose, but what they don't have is a process. Um, and the science is actually the first time that we actually have a definable process that sort of governs all of the scientific thought. And this is the scientific method. So it all starts with observation, right? And so what I wanna do is I wanna kind of do a little bit of a, a kind of like a walk you through this with uh, using an example of like an analogy of a, of, of a person, a scientist and a non-scientist, right? And kind of show you the difference between the two and uh, why this is kind of important uh, because it sets everything apart. So when you take a look at an observation, you're, just, you're not just observing, right? You're looking at nature. Um, and imagine that we have two people out on a nature walk. One of these people is a scientist, right? Or a science person. And the other one is like a poet, right? right? So more philosophical in nature, um, not very scientific. Both of these individuals see a leaf, a green leaf. And so they make the same observation, right? So what is the observation? The leaf is green, you can both see it, right? There's, so neither of these guys have a red green deficiency, right? right? So they can both see green. Um, and you see the leaf is green. So what's the difference then between the two if they're both making the same observation? Well, what really sets science apart is not in the observation you make, but in the question you ask. Because the very next step, and it's missing from here, so I always have to add it, is you always ask a question. Now, generally speaking, the poet will ask some sort of a philosophical question. What is the meaning of green? What? Right? And then it'll kind of start spinning off into La La Land and write an ode to the leaf, right? Um, and we'll, we end up reading about it in literature class. <laughs> but what does a scientist do? Ask a different question. Why is it green? Yeah. Not the big capital W-Y the little wy, right? This is a mechanistic question. How 
does it work? Now, imagine that these two individuals going on their nature work, nature walk, aren't from this century. They're not from last century. They're not from the century before. Let's put these guys back in the dark ages, pre-Renaissance, pre-scientific uh, landing, right? So there's no science. Alchemy, sort of, that's weird science, but, um, right? But there's no science. So they don't know a lot about science. As a matter of fact, chances are that these two individuals know next to nothing about science. But here's what they do know. Back in the dark ages, you knew a lot about art and literature and philosophy and theology. Those were the big things, right? The letters of letters and sciences in colleges. That's what you knew. That's what you grew up in. You grew up learning philosophy and and literature and things of that nature. This is what they knew and art in particular, right? So they didn't know much of anything. All they knew about was art. So here's the thing. Here's what you wanna do. Let the poet spin off. And while the poet is just spinning off into la la land, writing their ode, the scientist is gonna focus and try to figure this out, right? So here's what you do in the next step of the scientific method. You answer your question. So the question is this, why is it green? Well, we already said this guy has no clue about science, right? Does he have any hope whatsoever of getting this question right? No, does it matter if he gets this question right? No, it doesn't. Not for the scientific process. What he's going to be looking for then is an answer to his question, and we'll call that a hypothesis. This basically is the best guess to the question. Not, notice what I said not the correct guess it's your best educated guess based on what you know and what you don't know so for him he's well versed and well trained in art so he knows about pigments so what is his guess that's what he knows that's what his education gives him Right. He doesn't know anything else about anything else. So it's a te is this testable? And that's all it needs to be, right? That's the requirement of science. Objective, testable, those two, right? Those are the two cornerstones of science. So this is what he knows. So from his hypothesis, then, you should be able to make testable predictions. So there are two predictions, and they usually come in the form of an if-then statement, right? So for instance, if paint, then what? If then. So there are always if then statements, right? So if it's paint, it should rub off, right? With, of course, like paint thinner or something like that. Whatever this guy uses as a paint solvent to, to basically eliminate paint. So he knows how to do this, right? Because he's well trained in paint and pigments and things of that nature. So he could do this, right? So that's a testable prediction. However, what if it's not? If it's not paint, notice the if then statement. It shouldn't rub off. Should so, there always be two like that? Yes. Okay. Usually you want that you want like an if it is true, if it's not true. Because that way you always have something that your data would be consistent with. Because the problem is if you don't have the other one and you just have data, your data doesn't support nothing, right? So nothingness means nothing in science. So there's only positive um, data. So then what's his experiment? So water, if that's the solvent you wanna test out, right? Paint thinner, if you wanna try that one, right? So what do you do? You just try to rub off the green? and see which one it responds to, of course, what's gonna happen? What are the results gonna be? Yeah. So what does that mean then? Well, according to your conclusion, if it doesn't rub off, yeah. Yeah. 
exactly. So now what happens then is it probably brings up a whole lot of other questions. And then those questions can feed right into step number two. And generally speaking, whenever you do an experiment and research, you generate more questions than answers. So that's the reason why research is oftentimes very cyclic. It just keeps going and going and going and never stops. And it's self-reinforcing like an avalanche and just doesn't stop, which is good because that means people can have nice fruitful careers. They just ask one question, do a couple of experiments and they're off to the races until they drop dead. Right, so basically then if it didn't rub off, then you could say, well, that seems to be consistent with my second prediction. If it's not paint, it shouldn't rub off. Guess what, it didn't rub off, therefore it's not paint. That reason, that what you just did right there, when you use that line of logic, Right, so according to my prediction, if it doesn't rub off, then it's not paint. That is deductive reasoning. My premise supports my conclusion. Okay. What happens, by the way, logically, when your premise or your conclusion does not follow after your premise? That's called a non sequitur. So a non sequitur is actually a type of logical fallacy. It's when your conclusion does not support or your premise does not support your conclusion. And unfortunately, a lot of people use the term non sequitur to mean irrelevant and has, that's not, has nothing to do with irrelevancy. It has to do with logical inconsistency. Okay, so this is kind of what it looks like. So this is kind of a bigger version of it. So you can see you got an observation. Here they added the question in there. But here they got a couple of uh, alternative answers, right? So they got a whole bunch of stuff in there. It could possibly be, they don't know which one. Then they do an experiment. This will be inconsistent with one and four, so they can toss those out. Maybe they do another experiment. These will be inconsistent with two and three, so they can toss that one out. And then they think they've got five. Uh, and from five, you have different, uh, different predictions that you can test out. So if five is true, then we should see this, 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 and this. And of course, if you run your experiments to test those predictions, then and you do actually get confirmation of those predictions and that suggests that your hypothesis is indeed accurate, right? So you're kind of on the right track, okay? And that's kind of the way it works. Um, so, you know, when we, when we have this, we're saying that hypothesis five, like if you want to look at it in terms of like explanatory power, um, instead of running experiments and things like that, you're looking at observations, but you're kind of saying like, well, I have these potential uh, hypotheses, but five looks like it has the best power to explain what we see today, okay? And that's kind of the explanatory power version of it. So it's like uh, uh, a particular hypothesis, for instance, uh, will make some predictions. Like if this is true, then we should see this today, right? And then you look around, you're like, oh yeah, I do see that. That means that the more times you run into that, that you basically support or it's consistent with the prediction, then that suggests that that is a strong idea, okay? And that's kind of the, that's what I mean by explanatory power. And that's how the, a lot of those evolutionary modeling ideas work as they reach far, far back in the distant past. Okay. They're not actually doing specific discrete experiments on them. They're using more of that explanatory power idea and that prediction that if this idea were true, then we would predict that this is something we should see today. If the answer is, yes, I see that today, then it suggests that that's consistent. Okay. And that that's potential to hypothesis. Yeah. When I was reading, it said Francis Bacon invented that, is that right? The scientific method? Uh, I believe so. Yeah, and there's there's a couple. Well, it's been modified a lot. So <laughs> originally, the process kind of all sort of uh, got pulled together. There was it wasn't like um, it wasn't like now, right? Where he's like, uh, here I've got a process. I'm going to write it all down. I invented the scientific process. I'm going to patent it. I'm going to publish it, and I'm going to get all the credit for it. So what happened was there was a lot of scientists were just going through experimentation. A lot of the chemists were doing similar sorts of things. Um, and there was like bits and pieces of some things and some uh, scientific and experimental rigor that people were doing that seemed to work really well. That kind of started to come together. Uh, certainly Bacon was in the middle of a lot of that. Um, but it's not like, you know, in the 19th century, people then started saying, oh, we got to use the Baconian system or methodology. It kind of evolved over time. And really, most people didn't use a scientific method in the 19th century until we get the Mendel. Because I always hear Shakespeare was around someone named Francis Bacon. Is that a different person? Uh, that is a little. Uh, Francis Bacon was a lord. I don't know what his dates are right now. His history, his history dates are not 
um, I, that would be Elizabethan. So that's pretty, so Elizabethan is 17th century. So it could be because Shakespeare was a hobnobber, um, definitely speaking. I mean, he, he got in with the glitterati. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if, if he knew bacon. Um, but I would have to look specifically at the, yeah, that would be, I'd have to look specifically at the coalescence of the two dates for Shakespeare. Shakespeare I'm comfortable with, that's Elizabethan, clearly a 17th century. But I know Bacon is back in that area, but I'd have to, I don't know what the specific dates are for Bacon. Um, so I'd have to like take a closer look at that, but he is in that general range right now, but um, still. Yeah, I always thought there was two of them. Uh, I am not aware of there being two fancy Yeah. He was born in 1561 and died in 1624. So that is in the Shakespearean right around that era. It's a little earlier than Elizabeth. I think she's a, I think she's more later 17th century. So that's, I mean, it's kind of like Bach versus Mozart. Bach was kind of mostly gone when Mozart was like maybe a baby. Yeah. Like when Bach was around, so it, it's very close, but I don't well, think it's like right on top of each other. Was to oh, okay. So he's earlier than I was. I was thinking. So yeah. So he's earlier than I was thinking. So yeah, sixteenth. So the the transition between sixteenth and seventeenth century. So I was thinking more later seventeenth century, because um, I don't remember how long Elizabeth the first lived. And that could be convoluted with the fact that Elizabeth II lived forever. <laughs> that's, that's also possible as well. Um, but yeah, close. So I don't know of a two. So I don't know of two. Yeah. So, but yeah, I mean, there was like a sub, because in the 16th century, I mean, we, that's, I, we didn't really have a functional biology. And most of our methodology was coming from alchemy and the, kind of the proteo, you know, kind of the, the prototype of chemistry. So alchemy was like chemistry before we grew up, right? That was kind of like us playing with Silly Putty and Play-Doh before we actually started building buildings. That's so that we didn't know things weren't possible that back then. So a lot of our process came from that. And so, um, but all of those chemistry folks like Boyle and Charles, the, the famous chemistry gab, all the gas laws folks, I mean, a lot of them, would have written down their processes and things of that nature to make sure that, um, but they didn't actually like write it down. They didn't like teach it like we do now. They didn't like teach it. It wasn't a thing that was taught. It was just like, oh, the chemists kind of do this and it's good scientific rigor. And then it wasn't so much later that we actually decided to write it all down. That's the reason why it's like, well, yes and no, you know, so. A lot of the text from 100 years previous, Da Vinci was. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, he was, uh, well, him and Galen, actually Galen goes all the way back to Galen, which was a, a first century gladiatorial doctor, basically. Yeah, so I mean, Galen was, a, from my understanding is, if you don't count the Egyptians and embalming, was probably one of the first Western, like doctors that um, actually did dissections on humans. Yeah, so he was one of those early ones. I mean, you could argue the Egyptians were also in there too because they had to do embalming, um, but they didn't really do it for the purposes of understanding stuff. They just tore stuff out and put it in jars and yeah. So yeah, he was. He was. He was like the first true hardcore AMP. He wanted to know how this stuff worked. So he was. His society frowned on like desecration of the body. Yeah, which is yeah tough. Back, and that's always been a thing. And then Da Vinci, obviously, he did everything. Actually, Da Vinci is credited for the first one to actually discover arterial placking um, because he dissected some like old codger's body. Um, and he noticed that the arteries were all placked up with all the stuff. So he actually found arteriosclerosis, which is cool. Um, that's like the first diagnostic discovery of something. Galen was just a body parts guy. You know, it's like, you know, Here's us all this stuff, and how does it all connect together and work together? But yeah, that was kind of cool. Da Vinci's actually we have we can credit Da Vinci for a lot of things we don't realize. Um, that man was an amazing man, um, and people don't really know half of what he was capable of. And he was an amazing, 
amazing person. They don't make them like him anymore. Um, they probably, if I had to argue, you know, who is the foremost genius of humanity, uh, it, it would he would be right up there. If he's not number one, he's at least in the top three. Right. Um, definitely. Einstein, I'd probably put in the top ten, maybe. Um, he'd probably be top twenty. Um, because yeah. Um, I mean, that's a discussion for a different time, but, <laughs> but there's, there's reasons for that. Um, and uh, so the hypothesis, right? So this is basically um, something that's, like I said, it's your best guess, not the correct guess. It's your best guess. It's, a, it's designed to be what you know. And the idea in science is it's okay to not know. Right, that's why we're doing this. It's a it's a process of discovery. We don't know something, we want to know something, and so we have to be honest about what we don't know, which is another moment of intellectual honesty, right? Which is the reason why I say, in order to do science, you have to maintain that intellectual honesty. You have to be honest with yourself. How well do you really know it? Not how well do you want to know it? That's a different thing, right? So. Um, also, the other thing that we want these experiments to be is what's called iterative. Iterative, that is to say that you can sort of build. So once you start off with a bad hypothesis, or maybe your hypothesis is partially true, right, or partially correct, or consistent with your data, I should say, right? Correct suggests that you've already fallen in love with your idea, right? Because you're making a pretty bold statement there. But it's consistent with your data. But maybe it's not all consistent with your data. So what you can do is you can sort of fine tune your hypothesis, modify it a little bit, and then sort of retry it out and say, it's like, well, this is kind of like my hypothesis 2.0. I've made some revisions to it. I've sort of updated a few things. And now I want to try it and see if it's a more robust hypothesis, if it's now more consistent with my data, my observations. And so that's kind of like, and you kind of keep doing that, right? So you kind of learn a little bit more and you modify it to make it even stronger. You learn a little bit more, you modify it to make it stronger. And that's kind of that important iterative process in science. And that's what I'm talking about. Like, especially when we're talking about things like, you know, the reason why I say maintain your objectivity and be able to update your idea. This is the reason why I make those comments. Like the basic idea of evolution we have is an antiquated, dusty old 19th century fossil of an idea that is in dire need of updating and modifying, and that's exactly this process, right? And what I'm saying to the scientific community is let evolution be iterative the way every other scientific idea is when we grow in our knowledge. Instead of defending it like you're some sort of a holy warrior, like a crusader fresh you know, um, off of seminary defending your theological concept of evolution, right? I mean, that's an inappropriate thing. And there's people out there who do that. Many of them who do that, unfortunately. Unfortunately, some of them don't even realize that that's what they're doing. But the, that's the reason why I, I, I kind of talk about this is because if we want to grow in our knowledge of how it all works, it has to be iterative. We have to be able to take our hypothesis and say, you know what? This part of it is really strong and robust, but these parts are a little softer. And so let's go ahead and kind of maybe collect some data on those and see if we can sort of like modify those, refine them a little bit, make them more robust, and then it's going to be a stronger, better, um, and oftentimes more consistent idea. So things get better when we allow it to be sort of iterative and modified like that. And that's my big thing, right? Is iterative like more focused on like the plural aspect of most people focusing on it, or is it just... <laughs> No, it's everybody. Because once a person creates a hypothesis, technically uh, the entire scientific community owns it. Um, and it's up to the entire scientific community to work together to try to sharpen that. Because in science, we tend to, we work as a collective. Exactly, right? And oftentimes now we work as a collaborative. So it's less just one person doing an experiment in their basement. And it's more, you know, groups of people from universities across the world working together on different facets of a particular idea. 
and then pooling all their information and then pulling it together. And that's a very, very, very strong and helpful way to look at things. Um, so the other thing also is that when we're testing this, remember everything has to be testable, not giant, but tested. Then the idea is if it's true, that is to say that if the prediction that you generate from your hypothesis, if that's true, then your data, your experiment should be consistent with that, right? If it's not consistent with that, then what that suggests is not necessarily that the entire hypothesis is out the window, right? But that that one little piece of the hypothesis needs a little bit of updating. Okay, now that you know that there's some inconsistencies there, then you want to you know take a look at that and try to modify that and try to figure out, okay, wait a minute. So if we're a little off here, then what kind of experiments do we need to do in order to get the information we need to be able to figure that out, right? And that's kind of the way it works. That's the way uh, science grows. Uh, a perfect example is the T-Rex thing, right? There's something, a piece of data that was well done, right? So it wasn't a technique thing. We got past that, that stage of it, right? But that was something that was inconsistent, wasn't it? It was inconsistent with our original hypothesis. However, instead of throwing the entire thing out, what Mary Schweitzer did was follow that up and try to look for explanations to say, well, why? How could this happen? And uh, there's a paper that she generated that is still kind of a little controversial. It's still kind of in the mix where she suggested that perhaps um, iron acts as a preservative. And she did a couple of experiments on that to show its preservative properties on bone in real time. But that was a potential experiment that kind of attacked that mineralization process and the preservation of soft tissue over time. And so that was a, a place where it's like, okay, let's take a look at this and let's see if we can learn something more about this and make this idea more robust. Of course, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done there uh, because keeping tissue preserved over a couple of years is not the same as keeping it preserved over 65 million years. Uh, that is an enormous ask. Um, and so there's a lot of dots that need to be connected there. So let's take a look at the experiment itself. So once you generate your hypothesis and your testable predictions from your experiment, then the question is, where do you go from there? So generally speaking, when you set up your experiment, you wanna set up your experiment in such a way that you're gonna be able to get good data from it. Remember, you don't just wanna generate numbers. Anybody can generate numbers. You want your numbers to mean something. And so generally speaking, when you do this, you will typically have two different groups that you set up. You'll have your test group. So you have your test group, and then you have what's called your control group. So these two basically are exactly the same. The way that the only way they differ is by the variable that you're testing for. So let me give you an example of what we're talking about. Let me give you kind of an analogy. Imagine that I'm selling you a bunch of fertilizer and you're a farmer. You're growing wheat. My claim is that my fertilizer will make your wheat grow 10 times higher, giving you much more yield. How do I know that? Well, because I did an experiment, right? So here's what I did. I created this experiment, two groups, a control group and experimental group. Now they're all the same. They're all exactly the same. So all of them basically will have Everything the same. So they have the same sunlight, has to be. The same soil is the same. How about the rainfall? Same, right? Nutrients, same. Um, everything is the same. All the variables between them both are the same. What's the difference? The fertilizer I add, that's it. And that's the one I'm trying to prove to you. That's the difference. So this is gonna be plus, I'm gonna add the fertilizer on this side. There's gonna be no fertilizer on this side. And then what happens after the growing season? So hopefully if everything works well, 
the fertilizer addition side grows, as I said, 10 times larger than the others, right? Why do I do that? So this would be the experimental group. This is the control group. Notice the control group is the same everywhere except for the variable that I'm testing. Why do I do that? Yeah, right, because if I didn't do that, then the farmer could come back and say like, well, that didn't grow better because of your fertilizer, that grew better because there's better soil over there, right? I mean, that side of the, the plot has better drainage. That's why it grew better, not because of your fertilizer, or that side of it has a shadow on it most of the day because of all these trees over here. So it didn't get as much sunlight on. That's the why you saw the difference. So there's any number of variables that could be the problem, not your fertilizer. So when I control for all those variables, make them all the same, then what I can say is like, hey, guess what? Way ahead of you. It's not the soil, they're the same. It's not the sunlight, it's the same. It's not the rainfall, it's the same. It's not anything else because everything else is the same. The only thing that's different between these two is my fertilizer. Therefore, if my variable changes and it creates a positive change on the data, then it suggests that my variable is behind the change by my fertilizer. Make me rich so I can retire. Okay, maybe that last part is not the selling point, right? So that's, uh, but that's basically a controlled experiment. That's how you do it in science. You realize, especially in, in biology, because there's so many things going on, right? Most of the things we're interested in are multivariate. And so we struggle with trying to understand how each component or each variable works in a multivariate system. So when we are able to, we are always trying to form controls so that we can ensure that whatever change we see or whatever interpretation of our data is, is consistent with our variable, not something we're not considering, okay? That could have changed. That's a critical, critical, critical piece of experimentation. Matter of fact, if you wanna be a researcher and you go off into grad school and things like that, a lot of what you learn is how to develop good experiments, good investigations that are well controlled so that you can get good information and then you learn stuff and you publish it. And then everybody applauds you and you become a rock star and you win the Nobel Prize. Or, or not. Or you become a professor at a university, right? So that's a, a really, really big component of, um, of uh, science, right? So that experimentation component, that testability component. But you can see how that testability part uh, the testability requirement uh, is kind of a bit of a challenge for, especially when you're doing kind of more of that modeling work uh, into distant past, right? Because you don't have that discrete capacity to test something in real time. And so there's a limitation. That's the reason why you have to use that kind of predictive modeling kind of a strategy as well. The other thing that science does is what's called reductionism. This is basically when you break something down into its smaller parts. So when you're taking a look at a system, for instance, or a mechanism, you don't basically say, I'm going to study this entire thing in its entirety. You can't do that, right? Intellectually, that's like taking the hamburger and swallowing it whole. That's just not going to happen. You're going to die, right? And if you try to understand something very complicated in, in, in a whole, you're going to intellectually die, okay? Because it can be too much. So in science, what we do is we break all these things down into smaller parts, and we tend to focus on specific individual things. Here's a good example. When I was in the PhD program um, here at the UC Health Science Center, um, I worked on RNA splicing, which is a process that you see, and um, we'll talk about actual RNA splicing for the end of the semester. Um, but the overall, uh, was RNA splicing, but I wasn't focusing on the entire thing of RNA splicing. What I was focusing on is two proteins. That's what I was focusing on, U2AF 35 and 36, which is a protein that's involved in, amongst other proteins, this entire pantheon of proteins that do this particular process. That's a reductionist approach, right? So you can't make any headway when you're dealing with that much stuff going on at the same time. 
So what you end up doing is you break it all down and you say, I'm just gonna focus on what these two proteins are doing. How are they binding to the RNA? What affects the way they bind to the RNA? How are these guys behaving? I wanna understand everything about these two proteins here. And that's a reductionist view. The idea is some of my lab mates were studying other proteins in the process and they were just focused on those. And then overall, what we would do is we'd learn as much as we can about individual pieces, and then we would connect the dots, right? So basically what happened is our knowledge would grow, and then they would start to melt into each other, and then eventually we'd start to see a continuum of function, right? That's how we do it. And that's reductionism. Um, no other intellectual discipline does that, by the way. Philosophy doesn't do reductionism. Theology doesn't do reductionism. They don't take a big thing and make it small so they can chew on it. They take a small thing and make it big. I don't know what the opposite of reductionism is, expansionism perhaps, but that's what they do, right? So they make a big thing. And so it's just the opposite direction. Um, and then there's also kind of another philosophical sort of a thing that biology has in it called systems biology. This is where you're focusing on sort of the nature of these emergent properties that we have as you go from one classification level uh, to the next. Um, and uh, that's kind of its own field. Systems biology has a lot of statistics in it and stuff like that. So um, that's that's your thing. That's great, not mine so much. <laughs> um, then models, right? So I talked a lot about models, right? Uh, models are basically hypotheses. What a model is, is a story um, that basically predicts how things work. Right. And so what a model is, is kind of like a hypothesis uh, that helps to explain how you think things are working. And typically speaking, um, these are giant hypothetical stories. They're not true, right? Because we're still testing them. Um, this is just a statement of like, I think this is how it's working. And then I'm going to go ahead and go to work on these little pieces to try to figure out if, you know, if this piece of the model works. And the idea is the more of these models that we work on, the more pieces of it, they work. And it's like, okay, this is consistent. Then that sort of solidifies that model. And then we work on another part of the model and we just kind of slowly kind of piece it all together. So a model in science is very similar to an, to a puzzle. It's like, We've got this puzzle and we're trying to put it together. We don't know what the picture is, but our overall model is, I think the picture is this. And so I'm gonna go ahead and test it out. So if this, if, it's, if this is it, then I can go ahead and start working on the edge pieces and things like that and it should come together. And then as I put stuff together, so if it's consistent with the model, then that's success. That suggests that the model, at least initially is potentially correct. And then I can work on another piece. And if it continues to be consistent, then that suggests that perhaps maybe we got it right, right? Or what can happen is the model could be consistent over here, but when somebody's working on it over here, it's like, eh, didn't get so much consistency over here. So we got to modify one area of the model while hanging on to the other. Or in some cases, it could be the model is completely all off track, right? And so it, the consistencies tend to be just dumb luck rather than actual reproducible reality. And that idea of modeling is what I talk about when I'm talking about the modeling as we sort of especially reach back into antiquity back hundreds of millions of years ago and things of that nature. So it's just we're trying to put it together and it's, it's, it's a growing process. And this is what I mean, by the way, when I say don't fall in love with your idea, because generally speaking, most scientists are pretty good about not falling in love with their hypothesis because they don't know for sure. They know it's not correct necessarily but they're trying to figure it out. What typically scientists will do, however, is they will not fall over the hypothesis, they will fall in love with their model. They'll create such an attractive and scintillating story of how they think it all happened that they will begin to believe their own story to such a point where they start to lose grip on their objectivity, right? Well, there is actually quite a few um, folks. And that's part of the reason why evolution is so slow in updating because of some of these stodgier, typically dustier evolutionary biologists of the 20th century who see it as sort of an affront 
um, on their person and everything to question anything. And it's like, um, are you kidding me? What are you, a scientist? What are you? I mean, that's kind of the epitome of science. You question everything, right? I mean, that's what you do as a scientist. So that's, there is, yeah, that's one of those things, right? So that's the reason why it's like, you have to play with your model if you want it to get better. Um, it's never going to get better um, if, um, if you don't try to improve it and update it. And we've had a lot of stuff coming in. The genomics information is just a tidal wave of information coming in that's screaming, um, recalibrate, recalibrate, and rethink because there's a lot going on here we didn't know about and we need to figure out how it all fits together. Um, and a lot of the old codgers are fairly slow to the switch, to be quite honest with you. Um, and I don't mean like old codgers in age-wise, but old codgers in training and, and thinking. Luckily, there's a generational shift going on right now. And hopefully the older generation will be replaced by more of the genomics-oriented generation who will do a lot of the heavy work of some of this updating and and improving and kind of developing a 2.0 kind of a situation. It's a little bit more accurate. But these, remember, models are um, hypotheses. And, and one of the reasons, and this is a, a big reason, and, and I do have a lot of beefs because there is a lot of, of problems I have uh, with this. I mean, you can imagine this, but um, yeah, I don't, I don't mind models as long as they're treated like models, right? So, but one thing I hate to do is I hate museums. I hate them um, because most of those models, they propose oftentimes models and it's a story. It's a story of, oh, this is how we think the world looked back in the Cretaceous or whatever. And they kind of draw, they get artists duped into all of this to try to draw these great pictures. And they're interesting, right? But the problem is they don't present it as a model. It's like, this is how we think the model worked, right? This is a model of how we think the world looked based on, you know, maybe fossil ferns and things like that we found, cycads and stuff like that we found or various things. And this is the kind of the reason why. So this is where our modeling comes in. But it's like, oh, here's what the Cretaceous looked like. I'm like, really? You're that old, huh? You know that for a fact. Is that right? Um, yeah, I mean, we know some things pretty clearly, right? But there's a whole lot of stuff we really don't know especially not justifiable for some of those pictures. I mean, some of those pictures are pretty detailed. I'm like, you're looking at like, that's interesting. Last time I noticed, we don't have the capacity to time travel. So how do you know it looked like that? I mean, you could be like so far off. It's like just completely delusionally insane what you're trying to predict. I mean, it's like, you don't know. And that's the, that's the cool thing about it though. Right. The, that's part of the fun. The part of the fun is the discovery of the fact that we don't know. But the problem is so many of them are so bent up trying to say, oh, but we do know. No, you don't. You don't. You want to know, but that's not the same thing. Right. I mean, it could be completely different. I mean, the dinosaurs could be doing things completely different than what we ever thought. But the problem is you fall in love with your model. And so rather than treating it like a model, which is powerful, by the way, it's a powerful way to do science, to have this model, this story that you can test. But when you start basically, you know, rolling it out, um, like, oh, hey, this is it. This is the way we thought. It's like, really? Where were those experiments? I, I missed those. You know, just because you say it's so doesn't mean it's so. There's a lot of work to be done here. And you're kind of short-circuiting a lot of that work, honestly. That's what my frustration is. Because I see this as being a really exciting time, but there's a lot of people and a lot of thinking that are in the way and they need to get out of the way or we're never gonna really know for sure how it all went down or what it really looked like. One thing we do know for sure is the old codgers who invented all this stuff in the first place, the pictures I mean, and things like that, don't really have any clue, not any kind of a clue that they think they have. They don't know this as well as they think. Why? Because we wouldn't be finding soft tissue and T-Rex bones if that were true. I promise I wasn't going to do that to you guys, but here, I, I can't help it. 
I can't help it. it. This is a big idea, by the way. That's the reason why I do it, because it is a big idea. We are in the process of a generational shift, and it is a titanically important thing to get this generation right. And that's an opportunity that we cannot lose out on. Um, and this is a big deal, right? Because the way we think and perceive evolution dictates how society moves and breathes and operates. And if we're going to do that, and that's fine, but if we're going to do that, we need to have an accurate view of it. It needs to be accurate, right? Um, and I think that what it actually is becoming is going to be more exciting than what we said it has been in the past. Question. Well, and that's the problem, right? Because I mean, so what she what she noticed was, and I think she did a couple of things. This is her most recent paper, um, but I think there's still a lot. I mean, we don't know quite what to do with it just yet. Uh, I hope, and this this is what I hope. I mean, some of the the folks who are dogmatic will take a look at that paper and be like, "Oh, well, there's the explanation. Let's just move on." Like, no, 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 no. That didn't answer the question, right? Stay here and answer the question. Don't ignore the reality, right? We have questions to answer here. And we need to get answers, not just dodge it because we don't like the answers, right? But from my understanding is what she was finding is iron signatures that were consistent in the rock around the bones. And so she was finding that first. Um, and then when she did experiments of iron with bone in her lab, she noticed that she was able to get preservation of bone up to like two to three years. Now, so she kind of has a little bit of a nibble like a little bit of a beginning. So she has iron traces consistent in the actual fossil bed itself, which is interesting, right? Um, and then she also has this definable preservative power of iron in a lab itself, but she's only seen this for like two to three years. The question is, is that good enough? And is there enough iron in say like general bone and things like that? I mean, bone is bloody obviously, right? So there's gonna be iron there. So is there enough iron in there to actually preserve the bone over 65 million years? That's the big question. Um, just because iron is a preservative is intriguing, but you can see how we're not quite ready to make a conclusion yet because we still have to answer that longer term question. And not only that, but then the other question that I had was, is this just an outlier or is this a, a thing, right? Is most bones that we see actually like this, well, it kind of seems to suggest then that we're probably going to find more soft tissue in bones in general. Why? Because bones are bloody. So if they've got bone, and then most of the bones that we see potentially could be have some preserved soft tissue in them, which is crazy talk. Yeah, a lot of it is. Yeah, a lot of it is actually goes to the presupposition evolutionarily that mineralization has turned everything into rock. So there's no reason. To dissolve the rock, you would destroy you would destroy the bone, right? Because everything has been turned into rock. That was an assumption that we made, but we never actually tested it. Why did we make that? Because of our already inborn views of the antiquated, more antiquated 19th century view of looking at evolution. So the way we saw things kind of predisposed us for this particular failure. Which makes a lot of sense, right? You you pick out the fossil because back in the day, paleontologists would actually make a career off of just one fossil. It's like, hey, look, I got a Velociraptor fossil, and you'd be like the king for a while, right? So that was your claim to fame. So they had a lot of motivation to to protect it. But um, what Mary did, which nobody thought to do, was basically demineralize the bone. You essentially dissolve the bone. If you do that, and you assume it's rock then what you've just basically done was destroy your life's work. Which is one of the reasons why nobody's ever done it before because they knew that, they assumed that, right? Because after all, right? Nobody in the world would ever guess in a million years, no pun intended, right? That after 65 million years, you should see anything soft tissue. There's, it, it's just, there's no reason to believe that. That is as fundamental as just first day evolution 101, right? These guys are 65 million years old at the youngest, for T-Rex, no way in the world should anything soft tissue be there. It's all rock. 
So she demineralizes it and then she finds this and then that's just, it's just mind blowing, right? So that's the reason why nobody did it is because they just assumed it was all wrong. But it wasn't, right? And that's the reason why it's so fascinating. And that's also one of the reasons why you never fall in love with your idea because you will make assumptions that are not necessarily accurate. Why? Not because you tested those assumptions, but because you believe them to be true. Guess where the term believe resides mostly? Theology. So welcome to the world of theology, evolutionary biologists. That just made evolutionary biologists person. I could hear, I could feel their hair stand up on the back of their neck all across the campus, but that's what it is. That's why you always have to maintain your objectivity and constantly, constantly keep working on your model. Don't fall in love with your idea, right? Or your model in this case. So let's take a look at um, some, uh, so just to we kind of wrap up all this with scientific theory, right? So the idea of theory is basically a hypothesis and a lot of, there's a lot of ballyhoo about this, right? Sometimes be like, well, how do you know it's a theory and not a law? right, or a hypothesis and not a theory, and, and really the fact is in science, we don't really make the distinction, <laughs> to be quite honest with you. Um, I mean, a hypothesis is generally what we talk about in the context of an experiment that we're trying to run. We have a hypothesis that we think is the way things happen. Um, a theory is typically, and this is all textbook, by the way, this is not the way working scientists think, um, a theory, generally speaking, is a hypothesis that is fairly robust. It's been found over rounds of experimentation to be consistent uh, with data, um, and you're able to generate predictions from it. Okay, so that's a theory. And then generally speaking, a law is essentially something that is always true. Okay, uh, you don't have to test it. It's always true, right? Generally speaking, um, laws we usually associate with physics. And they tend to be applicable across the universe, right? It's the reason why you have the Newtonian laws, right? The laws of thermodynamics. These are the things that you can bet the farm on here on Earth. But you can also bet the farm on it to be true in the far-flung regions of the galaxy we haven't even discovered yet. Okay, so it's, it's universal. Those are usually the laws. Um, but basically you have a lot of logic, a lot of reason, and a lot of experimentation that leads you to your conclusions. And then of course, one's conclusions are always up for review and that is exactly the important thing. By the way, this is also another thing that sets science apart. Um, in theology, you don't have peer review, do you? You have arguments, <laughs> you have disagreements, but it's not really peer review. In peer review, it's like, you know what, I'm gonna take a look at your data. I'm going to take a look at your methods. Did you do it right? Is your data legitimate? And then are you interpreting this correctly? Would I interpret this the same way? Right? So either are these legitimate conclusions that you're bringing from your data? And a lot of times the answer is yes. I can see it's like you did, you were very rigorous in your process. And this is the reason why, by the way, Mary Schweitzer wasn't booed off the stage is because she is a respected researcher. Her colleagues know her well. They know her work. They know that she's not just a hack. Um, you know, she has been working in evolutionary biology for a while now, right? So um, she is well-respected. Her colleagues are aware of the quality of her work. So they saw the work in her paper and they're like, yeah, you've got, it's rigorous. It's your, your you know, your methods are, are strong. Um, I can't argue with those. And your data is your data. I mean, at the end of the day, when everything checks out, it's like the data is what the data is, you know, and it's up to us to change in response to the data, not up to us to change the data, right? And that's a very key thing. But that's where peer review comes in, right? It's like, and peer review is actually there to keep people from turning into like poli sci people, right? Like making the data say what you want it to say. It's like, yeah, you've, you're so in love with your model that you're willing to misinterpret or misrepresent your data in order to prove a model that's actually not true. 
actually, you know what? There has been a lot of examples of that. Um, and just to kind of, because I love picking on evolution because it's so big, so it, it needs to be picked on, right? But there's actually examples of fraud in evolution, right? especially human evolution, which is a train wreck, actually. I almost never talk about human evolution because it's an absolute shite show. I mean, it is a dumpster fire as far as I'm concerned uh, in evolution. Um, largely because there are a lot of anthropologists who, for the sake of staking their claim and making their point, were so obsessed with making their point that they would intentionally defraud the society by saying that some find that they had, like a tooth, for instance, was actually you know, Australopithecus or something like that. When in reality, when we took a closer look at it, it was a pig's tooth. There are documentable fraud moments in, in, in that. And that's, that's the reason why you have peer review is because it's like, okay, you've made this great discovery. This is Australopithecus. But let's go ahead and take a look at it and see. It's like, well, is that, yeah, I don't think that tooth is what you think it is. And uh, I kind of, it looks a little like a pig to me. And when you look deeper, you realize, oh yeah, that's a pig's tooth. Uh, so that pretty much then sets everything up and then everything just comes crashing down. Okay. And the human evolution, unfortunately, is like riddled with that sort of thing. Um, question. Yeah. People hear what they want to hear. That's true. People hear what they want to hear because they're not objective. If a scientist hears what they want to hear, then they should stop being scientists and go do something else earlier. Because scientists are defined and trained to hear everything and to start from there to interpret the world not to pick and choose what they're hearing that's only consistent with what they want. That, and that happens, by the way, that happens when you fall in love with your model. That happens a lot. It happens a lot in human uh, evolutionary biology, which is the reason why I have very little respect for that branch of evolution. What kind of evolution? Human. Oh. So it's like anthropologists and things like that. Um, because when you talk to them, it is clear they don't eat before they even show up to the dirt they have already got the answer in their head so you could show them an alien skull it right in front of them the alien could be alive and dancing in front of them and telling them how it all went down and they will still not see it i mean they're they are hor horrifically dogmatic they are completely blind and delusional um so, and that's unfortunate because there's a lot of fascinating questions in that area that they, I don't think are trustworthy, honestly, to be quite honest with you, to answer. Um, that's the reason why I try to focus on some of these things. And a lot of times they are the ones that I think about when I have some of these little comments. They're not doing anybody any favors, right? Okay, so what I'm gonna do next is I will actually move forward to some of the big themes. We'll cover those very quickly because we've got entire chapters to dig deeper into all of these, but we will stop there. And I will need to go down the hall. Are we staying here? No, we will go ahead and reassemble in lab.